Hello, my name is Alex Isles and in today's episode we're going to be looking at Sol and Mithras, two very interesting Roman deities. Welcome back. So in this episode we're going to look at both Mithras and Sol. So Mithras, as you can see behind me, this is the London Mithraeum that I've used as the background for this one is a adopted Persian deity within the Roman religious system and is a very interesting god and I've already looked in another video at the Mithraeum at Crawborough on Hadrian's Wall or Broccoli to Roman Fort if you know that better. But I'm also going to be looking at Sol and Sol's worship within the Roman Empire because he's another very interesting deity and we'll talk about him too. So why don't we start off by looking at Sol and the way the Romans worshipped him. So Sol was the representation within the Roman religious system of the sun and it's quite an interesting one as well because some historians seem to believe that he wasn't worshipped until the later Roman period but this is quite an interesting one um, when you look at it because he's a constantly worshipped throughout the Roman Empire. When he was constantly worshipped he was quite important in Rome and he did actually have temples but his worship really started to ramp up as you get into the 3rd century and the development of his cult. And as his cult developed, this very much was increased by the Roman Emperor, uh, Emperor Aurelian. Now Aurelian, he had Sol as his chief deity and he chose to worship him as Sol Invictus or the, the unconquered sun. And when he worshipped him as Sol Invictus, he actually created a, quite a large college of pontiffs or what we'd call a large college of priests to worship Sol and he continued to make Sol more and more important throughout the whole of his reign. Now when he started to make Sol more and more important there are historians who actually say that if Aurelian had had the chance he would have made the Roman Empire into a monotheistic uh, religion focused entirely on Sol. And this was a little bit nerve-wracking for the Romans because they'd already had a bad experience previously because the Romans had already had quite a bad experience with Elagalbus, a part of the Septimian dynasty, who had actually taken a Syrian sun god, Hello Galbus, and had made himself a representation of that deity and said, well, that sun god is actually me and I am that sun god. And that worship led him eventually to get murdered. When he got murdered, this really didn't help the way that people responded to monotheistic cults, um, especially the, the Roman monotheistic cults around Sol. And then after Aurelian's death, Sol was like not, was sort of sidelined and was still seen as important. Because Sol got paired with the cult of Mithras and then created this sort of understanding of Mithras, Sol Invictus, and the looking at the deities together and how they were understood within the Roman world. So if you just look behind me here, we can see depictions of Sol. So this one here is from Corbridge, and then on the other side here you can see Sol here as Sol Invictus um, from the Mithraeum at Crawborough, which we'll look at a bit more in the next part of the episode. But Sol is often depicted as youthful, he's depicted as young and you can see the nimbus of light around his head that some people then say also influenced the sort of nimbus of light you can see around Christian saints heads later. But that's the depiction of Sol as a young youthful figure with the nimbus of light around his head and he was sometimes compared with Apollo as well. So right here we have the cult of Mithras and Mithras started off as a Persian deity but similar to Jupiter Dolichenus what happened was that Mithras was taken away from the Persian um, religious sphere and made as a Roman god. So this is a really interesting one as well. Just as I mentioned before with Jupiter Dolichenus, Mithras was seen as Eastern so if you look here you can see you can see from the Tauroctomy from Halsteads, which is the bull slaying scene, that on his head he's actually got the Phrygian cap. And so again they're showing that he is an Easterner. The Romans took the name Mithras and then they took the stereotypes of Easterners and placed them on him and they built a new god around the Eastern Mithras. When they built a new god around him, this became a mystery cult that was then used throughout the army and was an incredibly popular cult for the Romans. When it was a popular cult, it was favoured 
by officials and military officers. And so these military officers would gather together, it was secret meetings where you go inside and you would learn the mysteries of the universe as you ranked up through the ranks, and it was a male-only cult. So again, it worked really well for the military frontiers of the Roman Empire. And we see these in different areas as well, but also in big cities as well. So Rome had its own Mephraims, London had its own Mephraims, there were them all over the empire. But we do also see them on the Rhineland frontier and also on Hadrian's Wall. So when you had these, you would rank up through the ranks and you started off as a crow or a raven, then you became the bridegroom, then a soldier, then a lion, then a Persian, the sun runner, and then finally you would be the father or the head of the cult. Again, we sort of may look at this as a more sort of egalitarian sort of cult, but again, I'm not sure how much mobility there would actually be within the, um, the actual cult itself, unless the head of the cult was on your side, and I'm guessing that most heads of the cults throughout Hadrian's War would probably be the commanding officer or someone like that. And so the cult head would then ensure that that was then... Um, so the, the rankings and the control would be there as well. It's quite an interesting cult because it's possible that it was a response in some ways to elements of monotheism, but also because of the fact it was a way of really easily unifying together a group of people because you then had a cult identity. Your identity was built up in your rank and how much of the mysteries that you knew within the Mithraeum. And so as you knew more mysteries, it would develop, you'd get to know more, and you would rank up and become more and more important. And so you would want to invest more and more into that, and it meant that within a military context, it builds connection and understanding between the various officers and helps to reinforce discipline within the unit. So quite a very useful cult for the military officers as well. As I mentioned before, we've got this wonderful depiction of the, the Tarochtomy, which is from Housteads, and then also you can see at the bottom here some of Mifras' attendants. Generally, a Mifraim was very dark, so it had a curved roof, the Tarochtomy was at the back, there were raised platforms on either side where the worshippers of Mifras would lie down and they would have communal meals. We know this from Christian apologists from the 4th century who would criticise the worship of Mifras because they said that they copied the um, communion meal from Christianity. And again, this has then caused some people to say that, oh, Mifras, the worship of Mifras actually influenced Christianity and then there's all sorts of and there's all sorts of modern day misunderstandings saying that actually, oh, Mifras was the influence for Jesus and all that sort of stuff. But that's not the case. They're two very separate religious ideologies that exist totally separately from one another. So when you've got that going on with the cult of Mifras and the, uh, the, the worship, people would come together to actually worship in that location. And Mifras was often paired with Sol. So if you look on this side over here, we've got Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. And so what they would do is they combine Mifras together and create Mifras Sol Invictus, which was a very popular deity as well. Because um, in the Taroctomies, you often have Sol represented as well. And so Sol is seen as connected with Mifras, the bringer of light, and then Mifras's uh, form as Mifras Sol Invictus then enables for there to be a cult worship that is uh, recognizing the sort of deity that has power over the entire universe, brings the light, and this light can be the light of revelation that then brings the entire understanding of the mysteries of the universe to light for the members. Now, the Mithraic cult starts to dip down in the fourth century and starts to become less popular. And some people say that's because of the rise of Christianity. But the worship of Mithras itself almost seems to have a redundancy built into it because of the fact that it's an elite cult membership that's a secret society. It can't be, you know, an open religion like the previous Roman paganism where obviously all the gods are accessible to people to pray to. And then obviously you have different members of society who are more connected to certain deities, such as Jupiter and the Emperor, you know, Mars with soldiers, you know, Venus or um, Juno with women. They are connected to certain groups of society, but they're not exclusive because obviously, we've, as we've seen before, that soldiers can worship Venus, that women could worship Mars. You know, there's all sorts of different connections. Um, also, women could worship Hercules to do with childbirth and childhood. So, 
you know, we've got very interesting ones there. They're very open to all. And obviously Christianity was a religion that said that all were a welcome and all could have forgiveness for sins through Christ's death on the cross. Mithras and the worship of uh, Mith uh, the sorry. Mithras's cult, Mithra, um, the Mithraic cult, the Mithraic cult does not have that built in whatsoever. When it doesn't have it built in, it is a specifically an elite focused minority cult that is for small groups of individuals to worship together and it's very uh, closed door. And because it doesn't access, allow women to have access either, that there is one example where there may be a female Mithraic worshipper um, within the Western Roman Empire. That's one example where it may have been the exception, definitely not the rule. So when we get these female um, exclusions, it means that Mithraic, Mithraic cults cannot expand. It can't have longevity. It can't become a cult that more and more people will follow, more and more people will worship. And it also excludes those who are not of the correct social status to be involved or to be invited to become members. Because again, you know, there's a benefit of having certain people a part of your cult, having that cult identity and giving them the ranking up and that wisdom of the infinite knowledge of the universe. And so because of that, that means that Mithraic cult was a closed door religious cult that eventually dipped down in uh, in which eventually started to decline in the face of Christianity, but also generic Roman paganism, which in its own way was so flexible that it meant more worshippers were more willing. So the more flexible religions of Christianity and Roman paganism would eventually overtake and see the decline of the cult of Mithras until it was just not relevant anymore to society. And obviously Christianity then became the cult that all people could access. So there's an interesting one for you there. What we'll do now is we'll look at a clip I filmed in the Great North Museum, Hancock, where we can look specifically at some of the altars discovered in the Mephraim, and we'll just put that on the screen now. Hello, my name is Alex Hiles, and welcome back to the Great North Museum, Hancock. Now, while we're here, we're going to be talking about a very interesting shrine directly in front of me. And this is a shrine dedicated to Mithras Sol Invictus. Now, this isn't a normal Roman deity. Sol Invictus is the sun um, unconquered, and he was a very important deity made famous by the Roman Empire Aurelian. But up here on the frontier, there is an, a commanding officer at Broccoli to Roman Fort. And what he does is, is at his Mithraeum, and Mithras is another very, po uh, very popular deity in the third and in the, to the fourth century in the Roman Empire. But when you've got that deity, what the commanding officer's done is he's actually combined together Sol Invictus and Mithras as a single god. Now when he's combined those two deities together, that's quite an interesting bit of theology because he's got unvanquished sun combined with the deity Mithras, who is the uh, another sort of Eastern deity who the Romans have adopted changed slightly, rebranded, and then made into a Roman deity right here. Um, Mithras as well is associated with the creation of the world, uh, slaying of a bull, making the world from that, fighting against evil, that sort of stuff like that. Um, very open to the officers of Broccolita Roman Fort. You know, you would join this and then you would rise up the ranks and it was obviously a mystery cult, so you could only be a part of it and it was for men only. And so I think this is an example of where a cult has been created to actually secure power for a new incoming officer or his new position on Hadrian's Wall at Broccolita. So I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you have, please do like and subscribe, share the video with your friends, and alongside this as well, write a comment below, because I'd love to chat to you more about some of the ideas we've put forward here and just some of the worship of Sol and Mithras up here on the northern frontier of Britain. If you'd like to support me further, I do have a Patreon, which you can support and find in the link in the description below. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon, and until next time, stay safe and well. Thank you very much.